Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you could all take your seats. We'll continue with day three of the Summer Teacher Institute and our penultimate presentation by Vivian Choi. Um, Vivian Choi is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of California at Davis. Her research examines the social, political, and technological intersections of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami and the decades-long civil war in Sri Lanka, giving particular attention to disaster and disaster risk management practices, conflict, and national security. Please join me in welcoming Vivian Choi. Thanks. You're almost off the hook. Uh, one more talk after me. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the organizers, um, Alex and Andy, um, for um, organizing such a great um, panel of speakers and for picking a topic which obviously I think is really important um, right now. So, <laughs> yeah, kudos. Um, so today I'll be talking to you guys about the intersections of two types of disasters. Um, one that we consider natural, although we've been sort of debunking what being a natural disaster is, which is the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, and another disaster which we might consider man-made, which is civil war. Um, right now I'm working on an ethnography, which is tentatively titled after disaster, tsunami, and civil war, and the persistence of insecurity in Sri Lanka. And it's based on my dissertation project, which looks at the intersections of these two disasters, and how in the Sri Lankan context they are inextricably woven together, and how they are both treated as issues of national security and threat. Um, my talk today is part of also my broader work, which considers disasters as processes, as multidimensional phenomena that can sweep across every aspect of human and natural life, which I think all of the talks we've seen so far have done a really good job of illustrating this. So first, I'm just going to give you a little uh, road map of the talk today. I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background information on the tsunami and on the social and political context of Sri Lanka. and then. I'll give you a really brief note on my methodology. Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and conducting ethnographic fieldwork is one of the hallmarks of my discipline. Um, and in that discussion, I'll get to explaining how I got to thinking about natural and man-made disasters together in Sri Lanka. Following that, I will spend the rest of my time highlighting some of the disaster management practices that have been implemented since the tsunami, and what these practices tell us about the ways in which people experienced and continue to experience the effects of both the tsunami and the civil war. I may be biased a little bit, but this is the strength of anthropological and ethnographic work, which is to offer up the stories and give depth um, and provide explanations for what we see happening in the world. I've sort of cobbled together two large chunks of um, my writing, so um, in that way I'm just going to try to paint as intimate a portrait I can about life in Sri Lanka. So, um, so uh, Sri Lanka is the small teardrop-shaped island just south of India. It's considered part of South Asia, and it's about the size of West Virginia, if that gives you any sort of idea, with a population of just over 20 million. And the capital is Colombo, which is on the, um, oh, that's not going to give you an idea, but it's on the western coast there. Um, just to give you some sort of demographic information, which will be a little bit important in understanding the social and political climate of Sri Lanka, um, I guess if you broke Sri Lanka down by ethnicities, you'll see that the, major, the majoritarian ethnic, ethnic group is the Sinhalese, with Tamil ethnicity and then Muslim and then other. So you see the breakdown there. And um, so Sinhalese is also con considered an ethnicity, but it's also one of the major languages spoken in Sri Lanka, as is Tamil. 
And you'll see that Tamil is 18% because many uh, Muslims also speak Tamil. Um, and then the major religion in Sri Lanka is Theravada Buddhism, followed by um, Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity. So um, you'll see that ethnicity is kind of, a, all of these categories are a little bit troubled, ethnicity in particular, just because um, being Muslim is, it is also is it a religion, it's not really an ethnicity. Anyways, so um, just to give you an idea of what the sort of social breakdown is on the island. Um, so now, I'm going to come back to that in a second, but now I'm going to do a little overlap. Supposed to. Okay, it's not working. There's, it's this is okay. So this was supposed to be a moving image of the uh, two th on of the tsunami, which happened on the 26th of December in 2004. On that day, a massive earthquake of 9.1 to 9.3 on the Richter scale, the third strongest earthquake in recorded seismological history rocked the Ring of Fire, a seismic belt of volcanoes located just west of the Sumatran coast of Indonesia. So, like, over on the right side, that sort of area. Um, oh, I guess I have this pointer, like, right over here. The earthquake, um, the earthquake also had the longest faulting duration ever observed, between 8.3 and 10 minutes, and even caused the entire Earth to vibrate as much as four centimeters. The earthquake triggered several devastating tsunamis along many land masses bordering the Indian Ocean, in total killing over an estimated 230,000 people in over 14 countries, even reaching as far as the eastern shores of Africa. Indonesia was the hardest hit, with over 160 deaths, and Sri Lanka, where I conduct my research, was the next devastated, with over 35,000 dead or missing and 500,000 displaced. It affected over two-thirds of Sri Lanka's coastline. So, the earthquake was here and then everything kind of radiated out um, that way. So the tsunami, of this, the areas in red are supposed to represent the areas affected by the tsunami. <clears throat> when the tsunami struck Sri Lanka, it struck an already socially ravaged shoreline. In 2004, Sri Lanka was engaged in what was then Asia's longest running civil war. I won't bog you down with too many details. Um, many people have, in fact, written entire books on the conflict, but a little background should help. Um, so perhaps some of you have heard of the LTTE, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, or sometimes referred to as the Tamil Tigers. Um, it was this insurgent militant group that the Sri Lankan government had been battling off and on since July 1983. The Tigers, who claimed to represent the voices and rights of all Tamils in Sri Lanka, were fighting for what they believed to be their homeland, called Elam, in Sri Lanka. The emergence of a Tamil ethnic and national consciousness and movement culminated from the increasingly discriminatory constitutional practices implemented by a Sinhalese majoritarian government. Uh, for example, in 1956, the Sinhala Only Act uh, was implemented, which made Sinhala into Sri Lanka's national language pushing many Tamil and English speakers, remember uh, Sri Lanka was formerly a British colony, out of governmental and administrative positions. Ethnic quotas were implemented in university admissions, also negatively affecting Tamils. Buddhism became consecrated in the Sri Lankan constitution, deserving special protection and rights. Social tensions had been mounting since at least the early 1970s, but July 1983 marked a turning point in already tense social relations between the government and the LTTE. During what is referred to as Black July, rioting, looting, and killing was targeted at Tamils, perpetrated mostly by the Sinhalese. The most striking aspect of the riots and the disorder and violence was that it was state-sponsored. Police, if not partaking of violent acts themselves, stood by and watched as it unfolded in front of them. In the decades following 1983, the war would take several twists and turns, with many failed attempts to come to a peace accord and periods, periods, of, periods of intense hostilities and fighting. Over the years, both parties would commit many atrocities, and the LTTE would come to be recognized as a ruthless, moralist organization that forcibly recruited child, 
child soldiers and was credited with the invention of suicide bombing, even garnering terrorist status in over 32 countries. The most hopeful moment for a peaceful negotiation came in 2002 when the LTTE and the Sri Lankan government signed a ceasefire agreement and there were temporary abatements in security and safety checkpoints throughout the island. However, the relative break in fighting would not last long for relations began to sour between the two warring parties again. When the tsunami devastated Sri Lanka, um, the death toll of the war had exceeded 60,000 with internally displaced populations fluctuating between 800,000 and a million persons. After the tsunami, there were hopes that the widespread destruction might lead to a unified effort to rebuild the nation, the government and the LTTE together. While the tsunami did provide a temporary respite to the volatile relations between the LTTE and the Sri Lankan government, unfortunately disputes over an aid sharing agreement, which was never executed, seemed to cast the final blow to the ceasefire. By 2006, the LTTE and the government were engaged in low-scale warfare. The eastern region of Sri Lanka, considered part of Tamil Elam, was taken over by and under the control of the government forces in 2007. By 2008 January, the Sri Lankan government declared the ceasefire officially null. 2008 was the year for war in Sri Lanka, and it marked the beginning of a concentrated military attack on the LTTE's territorial strongholds in northern Sri Lanka to finally rid the island of terrorism. That's what the government said. While the government did not achieve their goal of winning the war in 2008, they did finally claim victory over the Tigers on May 18, 2009. So this is a, a, a picture that I like to show. Um, it's a picture that I took when I first arrived in Sri Lanka to do my field work in 2008. Um, so, uh, oh, um, so this is supposed to be a representation of Sri Lanka with the areas in red demarcating uh, the areas that were under the control of the LTTE. And that's 2005. And 2005 was also the year that um, a new president was elected in Sri Lanka, and he was really the one who uh, was elected on the platform of ending the war. So here um, is supposed to be uh, 2007, when the government uh, took this eastern chunk, took control of the eastern chunk, and so only this northern area was left. And this is 2008, which is supposed to be the year for war, as the government declared. Um, and it's this pristine, peaceful um, island where there's no red terrorist controlled areas. And I spent a lot of time in the eastern region, and I'll get to that in a second. So my ethnographic field work was conducted over 15 months during this aggressive militaristic campaign, and I was still in the midst of my field work living in the eastern part of the island in a coastal town called Palmune when the war came to its dramatic end. I realized as I began to undertake my research on post-tsunami reconstruction that I needed to focus on issues surrounding not just post-tsunami reconstruction, but both the tsunami and the conflict. So to do this, I spent um, a lot of time with a lot of different people, doing a lot of interviews. Um, I spent time with disaster management practitioners, community leaders, communities of people displaced by both the tsunami and the war. Many of the people I came to know shared with me their experiences during some of the worst moments of fighting between the government and the LTTE, and their current experiences interactions with police and military. Many of these people were also living in temporary shelters five years after the tsunami. I also participated in community disaster preparedness workshops and evacuation drills. I also interviewed the special branch of the police, the special task force in Komune, who were able to continue their work because Sri Lanka's state of emergency was still in effect. At the national level, I situated myself at the National Disaster Management Center in the capital, Colombo where I observed disaster protocols and the technical coordination of a national disaster warning system. I also attended national rallies in support of the government's war efforts and victory. In Sri Lanka, for the most part, a tsunami was, until that fateful day in December, unknown. Stories were recounted to me of people scampering out towards the ocean when the water receded, 
marveling at exposed marine life, only to be unexpectedly swallowed by the massive black waves that returned to the shoreline. The international humanitarian response was unprecedented, sometimes referred to as the second tsunami or the golden wave. The overwhelming outpouring of support created difficulties in coordination and even fostered competition among aid organizations. So much of the post-tsunami research in Sri Lanka has fo focused on the impacts, efficacy, and challenges of aid and reconstruction. I decided to take a bit of a different tack because the tsunami brought into sharp re relief how unprepared Sri Lanka was for tsunamis and other natural disasters. The tsunami engendered new disaster-based practices and legal frameworks, including the Disaster Management Act of 2005 and their widely promoted roadmap for a safer Sri Lanka. And it's these sort of practices and legal frameworks that I became interested in. Um, because undergirding these new systems of governance is a logic um, that has actually also been traced in the United States that treats natural disasters and so-called acts of terrorism as seemingly inevitable events that need to be prepared for and managed ahead of time. In response to the tsunami, the government created the National Disaster Management Center in an attempt to make efforts to enact a proactive approach away from response-based mechanisms and towards um, uh, a, a, um, a prepared, what, what they call a preparedness approach. In this management approach, risk figures as potential disaster and future, future threat to national security. National threats are not limited to natural disasters, but also include health pandemics and terrorist attacks. Under the purview of disaster risk management, a preparedness rationale solicits new technical band-aids, warning systems, infrastructure management, evacuation drills and event simulations, and overall attempts to increase government management and control. The impetus of such programs and collaborations is to invoke a continual state of readiness and maximum security of state territory. It is not a matter of if a disaster strikes, but a matter of when. In Sri Lanka, then, the logic of managing disasters and conflict and terrorism must be understood together. The war is not merely the social context in which the tsunami played out. Rather, the tsunami engendered a certain way of managing uncontrollable events, including war and terrorism. I am interested in the ways that governance and disaster management policies after the tsunami articulate with the conflict and the Sri Lankan's government policies against terrorism, or the LTTE. Um, so that is, I don't think it's a coincidence that the war heated up after the tsunami. Um, as I'll highlight later in my presentation, this disaster management logic was also used as a moral justification for increased militarism and securitization of areas in Sri Lanka, in turn leading to a palpable lack of social and political change even after the war was declared over. Um, so one of my guiding questions in my research has, has been to ask, well, so um, especially in the case of Sri Lanka with these issues of insecurity, when, it, when can you say a disaster is over? And um, in light of that question, what is it like to live amidst the sort of ever-present possibility of possibly another tsunami or an outbreak of violence? Um, so, next section. So this is a section I'm calling anticipation, and um, it's a, and the next section will have a different theme. Um, and I, I call, I use anticipation because I think it's a, it's a good sort of word that highlights the way that the government, for example, has these anticipatory projects for managing disasters and terrorism. But it also, for me, what I found in my research, um, highlights other forms of anticipation that um, are enacted by those who have been living in the aftermath of both the war and the tsunami. So I'm gonna go into like an ethnographic story now. In different coastal regions of the island, a total of 50 warning towers have been constructed as one of the preparedness projects undertaken by the Disaster Management Center. These towers are all connected and communicate with each other via satellite from the village, district, and all the way up to the national level um, at the Disaster Management Center, which is in Colombo. They tower above homes, and even when they are silent, serve as reminders of a potential disaster. 
In July 2009, two months following the end of the war, I found myself participating in a tsunami evacuation drill. I wiped the sweat from my brow and shifted my feet, standing in the hot late afternoon sun. We turned and faced east towards the ocean, although tall trees and homes obstructed our view of it. Behind those trees, the newly erected disaster warning tower, shiny red and white, tall and majestic, would be wailing its warning siren in just a few minutes. Today would be the first time it would be put to the test. At 3 p.m., the warning was scheduled to sound off, kicking off a tsunami evacuation drill. With three minutes to spare, I took a quick look behind me at the houses of the locals who would be practicing their evacuation procedures once the warning siren went off. Over the sound of silent anticipation, the din of drums and music at the nearby temple festival could be heard. I looked at my watch, 3 p.m. I looked towards the tower, silence. 3.05 p.m., still nothing. 3.15, I sent a text message to my contact at the district management, the dis district disaster management office. What's wrong, I asked. Just wait, he texted. So we waited, and still no siren. I stood there waiting to be jolted into action. How loud would the siren be on a clear day like today with no wind, when the siren could supposedly be heard within a five kilometer radius? The quiet street now had become populated by those who had been given advance notice that they were to participate in this as yet to happen evacuation drill. They began to trickle out of their houses, some clutching their emergency bags. Others brought out plastic chairs and sat in front of their homes while they waited for danger to be signaled. We were all ready. Finally, at 3.30 p.m., the local disaster coordinator in charge of the drill heated a phone call. Picking up a bullhorn, he climbed atop a colleague's motorbike and turned on the decidedly less dramatic sounding bullhorn siren and raced down the street. People took this cue and began their movements towards the designated tsunami safe site a small Hindu temple about a kilometer inland. Some ran, shouting, carrying their disaster bags, acting as if danger looked closely. Others walked leisurely, laughing and talking along the way. This actually was not the first time the siren had failed to sound, either as scheduled or during a real tsunami scare. Previously in 2007, when another earthquake rocked the ring of fire off the coast of Indonesia, signaling another potential tsunami, the very first built disaster warning tower in the town of Maradamune stood steadfast and silent. That is, until the local disaster management coordinator climbed it and manually turned on the alarm, at which point nearly all people in the surrounding areas had already evacuated. The creation of a national disaster warning system in Sri Lanka has indeed been a process of trial and error. My friend Lakshmi informed me, we are always alert. She, like many others living near the shoreline, is aware of the slightest shift in wind, the gray color of the sky, and the behavior of birds. The day of the tsunami, the sky was a gray color engulfed with clouds. Whenever days were cloudy, Lakshmi told me she felt nervous, often avoiding going to sea like many others. Sometimes false alarms and rumors of tsunamis spread on days with high winds. On those days, many fishermen would stay home and avoid going out to the rough sea. Temple and mosque loudspeakers also now double as potential community warning broadcasters. Local astrologers have predicted that the coming years will bring unforeseen catastrophes. Alongside and beyond the preparedness rationale of the government disaster management projects, people too consider the possibility of another disaster. The threat of it persists. So as I stated earlier, Sri Lanka's post-tsunami roadmap for a safer Sri Lanka was also being paved on an increasingly militant and volatile context of war. As I mentioned, the conflict began to heat up following the tsunami, so utilizing the moral justification of fighting a group labeled as terrorists, the government waged their major offensive in 2008 and, and proclaimed victory in 2009, prompting the government to boast that Sri Lanka is the only country in the world to have defeated terrorism. But could such a proclamation be so easily celebrated? Especially in the eastern coast, military presence after the war continued unabated. Although the east had already been freed from so-called terrorism in 2007, the state of emergency was still in effect. 
um, granting special powers to the STF, which is a special arm of the police. The STF conducted, regularly conducted neighborhood and house checks, making sure that random strangers or potential terrorists were not taking refuge in the area. Officers could be seen roaming the streets, entering homes, and then lounging at the local tea stalls. As an interview with the commanding officer of the STF revealed to me, quote, the war is over, but terror is there. He continued to inform me that the division in which I was living and researching in was deemed a vulnerable area, and it only made sense to increase the number of troops as a measure to counter terrorism and secure the situation. Not a few weeks after this conversation in Kalmune, the Sri Lankan army began rebuilding an old camp that had been run down for over a decade. And so it was not as if an easy and quiet peace had come to settle over Sri Lanka. In the rebuilding of the nation, the past continues to hover uneasily over daily life. With the ever-present STF conducting their checks, my friend Parvati explained to me how she stayed ready. As long as we have all our documents and have registered all of our family members with the police, the STF will not give us any trouble when they are doing their checks. The fear of arrest or violence was even more palpable after the end of the war, when people would confess to me in hushed tones their disbelief that the LTTE leader, Prabhakaran, was really dead. A rumor went around about a boy on a bus who, unaware of the presence of a police officer, proclaimed his disbelief and was unexpectedly smacked by the police officer for making such a statement. People could only tell me, resigned, that inside we feel sad. The potential for the resumption of the war also lingered. People commented on my seeming naivete when I probed them about the end of the war. Who told you the war was over, Fauzi asked me. Have the food prices gone down? Are there new jobs? If the government and the LTTE want to start up the war again whenever they want, they can. Um, Sitima explained it to me like this. She said, in the sea there is a lot of fish, but can you catch all the fish? Any little thing can start things up all over again. And if the government and the LTTE want to start something, they can. These various experiences and sentiments speak to the reaches and limits of the government's anticipatory and preparedness measures for tsunami and terrorism. Security articulates differently when considering how people rely on their neighbors, the sound of the ocean, the gray of the sky, the tug of memory, past warning failures and hasty evacuations from danger. They shape how people are attuned to the future and to the past. People very well know the fragility of peace. They anticipate that something could always be, a condition of living in a place that has been sometimes cruel and often difficult. This anticipation is not only evidenced by the ways in which people are prepared, bags and ID cards safely packed with a change of clothes, but it is also an awareness and a recognition that danger still lurks and has long been a part of life in Sri Lanka. Who or what institutions can people trust? As Najima informed me, quote, the scientists, the experts, they can know about earthquakes and the tsunami only after they happen, but only Allah knows if they will happen beforehand, and only Allah knows if the tower will work. So that's the end of that section. Um, what I've tried to highlight in this section is the ways in which the effects of the disaster persist and how they've actually been a, a part of the history of Sri Lanka. Um, and how difficult it is to actually locate the beginnings and ends of things. Um, so if it is difficult to say when a disaster is over, in the face of persistent insecurity and the possibility of a tsunami or an outbreak of state-sanctioned violence, how do people persevere? How do they endure? Um, so this next section is called Enduring. And um, for me, enduring resonates in many different ways in Sri Lanka. On the one hand, it points to, enduring points to the sort of ongoingness and the issues of persistent insecurity um, in Sri Lanka and, and, the, and the ways in which security has become a part of everyday life. On the other hand, um, enduring also foregrounds the practices of living with and within these circumstances, the sort of endurance that people have sort of collected and um, um, 
over the years, and I'm interested in how new forms of social life maintain the force of existing and specifically difficult social circumstances. How do Sri Lankans endure the effort it takes to strive and to persevere? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I conducted much of my fieldwork in the eastern coastal region of Sri Lanka. I chose this area because not many other researchers had focused, um, had done their research here, but also because it is the site of a complexly layered social, it is the site of complexly layered social and political histories of violence, forced migration, displacement, and resettlement. Um, so Kalmune, which was the town that I was in, um, it suffered, the eastern coast in particular suffered the worst in terms of highest levels of casualties and property destruction because it was the coastline that was closest to the, where the earthquake was and you know, from where the tsunami came. Um, and also it was once considered part of the LTT's homeland and so it was a territory that was really fought over a lot. Um, and um, when I was there, even though it, I was there in 2008 and 2009, and even though that area was liberated, quote unquote, and under the control of the government, it was still very highly securitized and militarized. Um, initially, the tsunami was seen as the great equalizer. It was an act of nature that indiscriminately destroyed and killed. The dark tidal waves did not care if you were Tamil or Muslim, Christian or Buddhist, tourist or Sri Lankan. It is true the tsunami did not know about the past or why some areas would be more devastated than others. However, following the tsunami, the eastern region of Sri Lanka will become the focus again of state implemented territorial and land policies. Um, then President Chandraka Kumaratunga hastily put into effect a 200 meter no build buffer zone a territorially defined strip of land along the coastline in which damaged and destroyed property was forbidden to be reconstructed. Across the southern and eastern coastlines, um, this uniform uh, 200 meter buffer zone was put into effect, preventing those with destroyed homes to begin rebuilding. This initial zoning law was made largely out of the desire to take urgent action in the chaos of the aftermath and the government claimed the public security of the nation was at stake. While the designated buffer zones did not necessarily correlate to the extent of the damage and environmental factors influencing exposure, the government claimed at the time that there was a need to act quickly before people moved back to risk-prone areas and that the uniform buffer zone was the fairest way to do so. Only when land scarcity issues began to stymie reconstruction efforts and that the uneven buffer zone demarcations began to fan the already glowing flames of ethnic tensions, did the government begin to reconsider how to fairly redraw the no-build buff no buffer zones. The coastal towns were also sandwiched between uh, the A4 highway and paddy fields and the ocean, so re the redrawing of the buffer zone uh, was a really difficult process. Um, you know, you can't just move people you know, lots of people backwards um, away from the ocean. Um, and the east also, which I didn't mention earlier, was the most densely populated area of the island. So there were a lot of issues at play that made resettlement and reconstruction really difficult. Um, and so you can see in this picture sort of, sorry, I forgot I have this thing. Um, you can see these are foundations of homes. This is how close they were living to the shoreline. And that, and this was taken, you know, five years after the tsunami, they were not allowed to rebuild. Um, um, so in 2005, the, the, the buffer zone, the 200 meter uh, was relaxed, and in the eastern coast, it was relaxed to 65 meters. I spent much time getting to know the residents of a temporary housing scheme in Calmone, which housed 16 families. It was built on a small piece of government land, which was formerly a rubbish heap, and nestled between the buffer zone and other newly built tsunami homes. Here they were patiently awaiting, nearly five years after the tsunami, their tsunami flats. Oh, this is another picture of the buffer zone from the land view. Um, so because, because of the land scarcity issues, the reconstruction solution was to build flats up and not homes, which would have, which would have been to build out, right? 
So these temporary houses were constructed out of thin wood and corrugated tin. The heat in these homes was relentless. The tin walls of the semi-permanent makeshift structures did not only just attract the heat, it held it in, it radiated it. Units were one room at most about 12 by 12 feet, although I never actually took measurements. Families formed multiple units next to each other. All units shared walls and any notion of privacy was compromised by the fact that they all shared one roof. The noises coming from one unit were shared by all. All families shared one water tap. On one side of the temporary shelters, a makeshift veranda or covered area had been created. It was here that I spent much time chatting with those living here. It was covered and therefore a bit cooler. These temporary units were but 200 meters from the sea. Only the palmyra trees, old and now overgrown foundations of homes and upturned wells stood in between the ocean and the housing scheme. So this is a view as if you were standing next to the housing scheme and looking towards the ocean. Sitama, an elderly Tama woman who was living in one of these temporary units, told me about the last time she saw her two sons who were taken from her by the Sri Lankan army in a roundup of young Tamil men in the 1990s. So um, the 1990s were a particularly um, intense time of warring in Sri Lanka. And often, um, so what needs to be understood is that the Tamil tigers you know, they said that they represented all Tamils, but obviously not all Tamil people were in line with the movement. And often if, there, if the LTTE had made an attack on the Sri Lankan army, the army's response was to retaliate by round, what they called doing roundups, and they would just take young Tamil men in certain areas, um, especially in the eastern coast, and, um, and uh, take them away, incarcerate them, most of whom were never seen again. Um, so after months of almost daily visits, I had learned that Sitama had lost two sons in the war, but I had not pressed for details until one day the story, like her tears, poured out. It was the first and only time I had seen her cry. Her older son's name was Dharma Ratnam, but she could not recall the name of her younger son. She only remembered that they always called him Thambi, which is the term for younger brother in Tamil. She said that they would have been 35 and 32 years old, respectively. During those years, many lost sons and daughters. Some families lost two or three, two or three children, nearly like the tsunami death, Sitama recounted. It was July 7th, she said, and the Sri Lankan army had been going through villages and rounding up all the young Tamil boys in the nearby cemetery. The boys were then all put into a truck. When family members stopped by, the army would chase them away. Maybe my sons would have seen, him, see, seen me, Sitama wondered aloud, but I couldn't see them. The army claimed that they didn't have her sons, and when she asked them where they were, um, and when, the when she asked them where they were, when the truck started to move, Sitama said she ran after it, but was obstructed by the police. Odi, odi, odi which means run, 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 they shouted at her. She never saw her two sons again. Sitama tried to find them. For two or three years, she said she looked for them. She collected her documents and files and sought the assistance of the police, visiting offices in Colombo and um, in, the nearby, in nearby in Karatibu and the capital of the Eastern District, Ampara, asking about her sons. Everywhere, they went, everywhere she went, they all said, no, no, we don't know of those boys. She was finally given monetary compensation in Colombo for the loss of her sons, 30,000 Sri Lankan rupees, which amounts to approximately $300 in the United States. Sitama thinks of her sons all the time, she says, but she does not always share her feelings or thoughts. At family gatherings, she especially wishes that her sons were with her. She knows she is not the only one who suffers. Everyone has this sadness, she says. Everyone has feelings of missing their loved ones. People go on with their daily work, Sitama claims, because without work, they will be too sad. And so she says if she ever has sad thoughts, she tries to change them by doing work. Indeed, the mornings we would often chat while she did her work, roasting peanuts and bagging them to sell to school children, preparing the ingredients to make curry powder, preparing curry for lunch and dinner, sweeping her tiny one-room shelter, or watering her small garden. 
This is Selvi, the ever generous shopkeeper and giver of a cool Coca-Cola on extra hot days. Um, she told me how she had lost her daughter in the tsunami. They were together that day, and when the water came, Selvi grabbed on top of a palmyra tree and told her daughter to hang on tightly. But alas, the water took her away. Selvi herself was hurt and in the hospital for a month after. Her daughter's body was never recovered. On the anniversary of the tsunami, Selvi goes to the temple for a special puja and, the gives, and then gives food and clothing to the local orphanage. She says it is because so many people lost their children that they try and give to children on that occasion. Her special puja is also for her daughter. She explained it to us. Quote, when her soul is roaming, sometimes she will feel sad because she feels, oh, mother and father have forgotten me. And so to do a puja, Selvi feels that her daughter's soul will feel remembered again. Even in heaven, she says, the soul will feel sad and sorry. After her daughter passed, a fortune teller walking through the village, um, just passing by, looked at her and said that there was a soul following her, which Selvi takes to be her daughter. It reminded her of how she used to call her daughter Little Cow, as a little girl always used to follow her around. Big tears rolled down Selvi's cheeks as she told me this, but she does not break down and cry. The past literally hovers over her, a reminder not allowing her to forget, even as she is settled into a new home away from the ocean. She told me that she now lives for the future of her older daughter. She maintains her small shop full of packets of laundry detergent, shampoo, and small bottles of Coke and Fanta. If there is another tsunami, she tells me, she will run. And that's a picture of Selvi doing a puja. Um, so some months after we had started working together, I asked Usha, my research assistant, if hearing all these sad stories also made her sad. She responded by saying that she had heard so many stories, sad stories, that by now she was used to it. She, even though she was used to all the sad stories, she noted that it was still interesting to hear them because each root of sadness was different. So it is not necessarily my purpose to convey all the multiple and varying degrees of traumas so many of my friends and confidants have had to endure through the years. In terms of scale, the destruction and toll wrought by the tsunami and war was expansive. Official numbers proliferate in a litany of death figures, over 30,000 dead after the tsunami, over 60,000 casualties of war. Scaled down to families, the numbers are still staggering. In the east, tsunami claimed 14 from Fadra's family, five from Salvi, two for Taranga, eight for Ravi. In the distant past, a number of Tamil families I came to know had lost many of their male kin. The devastation adds up on both a universal and intimate scale. But to say that the everyday is bogged down by these demons casts a pallid and monocular vision onto the everyday. For while the memories exist, and indeed it is upon these memories that lives continue to thrive and persist, they are not wallowed in daily. They, are too, they too are forgotten, only to make themselves remembered when the occasion sees fit. So it's talking about roots of sadness. Now I'm going to talk about a different kind of root, which is actual physical roots, um, which are a complicated matter when attempting to travel in Sri Lanka. Um, as I said, because the East was under the control of the LTTE, um, it is still sort of perceived as being under the threat of insurgent activity and lurking terrorists. So um, just thinking about the physical landscape, like the warning towers, kind of dot the coastline, the military checkpoints also dot the physical landscape of Sri Lanka. And even after the end of the war, the STF continued to monitor these roadblocks and checkpoints, um, while, as I discussed before, also con continuing to conduct the neighborhood and house checks. Um, these checkpoints function to identify and mark those who seem suspicious and potentially dangerous, a recognition of the possibility of an enemy within. S leaving the east, to go to the capital, Colombo could take up to 12 hours on the bus. The same trip reversed took about eight hours. Um, and this was because it was assumed that um, those who were making the journey out of the east, which is where mostly Tamil and Muslims live, trying to make their way to the city were Tamil, right? And, and therefore possibly, you know, um, possibly terrorists. Um, and so the roads leading out of the east were monitored by the Sri Lankan army and at each checkpoint everyone, unless you were either elderly or a mother with a child, 
or foreigner like me. Everyone had to get off the bus with their bags. Um, bodies were frisked, bags opened and inspected. The bus would also be examined for bombs and hidden artillery. Artillery. The first 20 kilometers, the bus would stop at least five times, each time at a checkpoint. Um, so it just, that, that's why it took so long to get, to get out of the east. Um, and as you can imagine, during the day, the heat was relentless. Um, it was stifling if you had to wait in the hot bus or if you had to stand outside waiting for your inspection. So many would try to make the journey at night when it was cooler, although nighttime, of course, hosted its own set of concerns. Checkpoints figure both as a physical and imagined barrier for travelers. Tamil women especially were, re were, were weary of travel and weary of checkpoints. They had heard tales of violation and physical and sexual assault by military personnel manning the checkpoints. Um, this is Mohan, who one day I was passing the afternoon with Mohan, a man who lost his wife and two children in the tsunami. His old home was in the buffer zone along the shoreline. And currently, he was living with his sister in her post-tsunami home, which was near the temporary housing scheme. He described his situation and experience as it was for many others. He said, people who were poor are now rich, and rich people are now poor. His shop, which he ran from his home, had also been destroyed. He did not have the funds to start it up again, despite some money he received, which was not enough, which he then returned from an NGO. He says, now he goes with others on their boats to fish. When I asked him if he feared the sea, he responded, why fear the sea? Going to sea is like going to war. If you come back, it's a victory. If not, that means death. We have fear living here because of war. But under the roof of the sky, we have made our home here, and we are living and adjusting. Adjusting to the conditions of life after the tsunami and during and after the war was difficult. According to Mohan, if we want to live, we should live in a happy and peaceful way. Now, if we want to travel, I have to get down because of checkpoints and there are always problems. He explained that he couldn't travel freely and it was difficult even to fish or to attempt to get any other job. We are just staying here. How can we say the war is stopped? If the war is stopped, we should be able to travel freely for our needs, but with the checkpoints, we must wait so long in the hot sun. Mohan took me to his old home where his old shop used to be, which is now just grass. The grass grows ever steadily, covering up the foundation of his old home. So that's Mohan standing on his old house. So um, this political cartoon appeared in the Sri Lankan English daily newspaper called The Daily Mirror, um, April 12, 2012. So I think it's eight years after the tsunami and three years after the end of the war. And, and so for me, it does a great job of illustrating the ongoing issues of national insecurity and social anxiety around both disasters in Sri Lanka, tsunamis and state-sanctioned violence. Um, so this cartoon followed a tsunami scare that had happened just the day before. Um, another big earthquake had struck the coast of Indonesia and um, inducing a series of panic and tsunami warnings for countries in the Indian Ocean. In Sri Lanka, an official warning was issued too late by the meteorology department. It was issued after the time the tsunami would have actually hit Sri Lanka shorelines. Um, even still, as my friends and other news outlets proposed, many, including other government agencies, had heard somehow of the tsunami-genic earthquake and had begun evacuations. Electricity was cut, coastal train lines were halted, and I was informed that military on foot went through villages warning people. As one report evaluated, however, it is doubtful whether the government can claim credit for that awareness. Um, this lack of coordinated response was interesting given that the Disaster Management Center had just moved into its new high-tech premises in Colombo. Um, and so the cartoon also points to um, the continuing rise of disappearances in Sri Lanka, um, and actually at, at around the same time in April of 2012, um, these uh, continuing disappearances and kidnappings were being documented, um, some, of which it, some of which the government's involvement 
were confirmed. And so it's called the white van syndrome in Sri Lanka because it is, is often an unmarked white van that is used to kidnap people. So in, in light of this, I am reminded of Sitama shrugging her shoulders and asking me, what has changed? This is why I am interested in the enduring, for I have had much difficulty locating the ends of disaster in Sri Lanka. And to recognize disaster as chronic, experienced as part of ordinary life, is to see how it is endured. And within the seemingly enduring terrain of insecurity, as I have shown, life must go on. There is living, there is endurance, perhaps not of a victorious or ostentatious kind of vitality, but vitality nevertheless. Uh, questions for Dr. Choi? I don't know if it's much of a qu uh, question, but it certainly, I think your presentation made clear that suffering knows no distinction between natural and unnatural causes. And, and so I think um, your presentation really highlighted that point. Thank you. And just for me to be clear, because I do believe you said it in the beginning, but they were fighting amongst themselves. So, yes, it was a who civil were the, war. Okay, so who were considered the terrorists? The L, the I don't know if this is working. Um, it was the LTTE. So, um, it's a so basically um, post independence when the constitution, all of this stuff was being drawn. Um, there were these sort of shifts in power and basically what ended up happening was that many Tamils were starting to feel discriminated against um, and there were a lot of different Tamil political groups but it, it just happened to be the LTTE that emerged as the sort of sole representative of Tamils and really they became in power because they killed off other political parties. They're a very um, violent group and so um, and so they are the ones who sort of rebelled and were calling for their own homeland in the island of Sri Lanka. And it was that party against the Sri Lankan government. Um, and the reason why um, they are called terrorists is sort of because of their tactics. They have been credited with um, uh, innovating, uh, with the innovation of suicide bombings. Um, and so they've garnered terrorist stat, uh, status in a lot of different countries, which is why, in a way, the, especially in, in sort of the post-9-11 context, why the government was really able to kind of amp up their war efforts because they borrowed a lot from, say, the U.S.'s anti-terrorism rhetoric to say we are battling terrorists too and these kinds of actions. The, the end of the war was very, very controversial, but they sort of justified it as, you know, we are trying to combat terrorism, and, um, and that's how they justified it. Uh, I have one question. Sure. Uh, at an earlier talk at this institute, uh, there was uh, emphasis on the case of British India in the 1870s, and uh, especially the way in which Malthusian thought was used to justify a lack of British colonial intervention in the uh, 1877 uh, drought and famine, uh -huh. if I have it correctly. And the argument was that uh, insofar as overpopulation was seen as being inevitable and contributing to natural disasters, it was a way in which colonial officials could dispossess themselves of responsibility for intervening. Mm -hmm. Now, in your case, it seems to be that the inevitability of natural disasters, such as tsunamis, is used as an excuse for the Sri Lankan government to, to possess greater control, surveillance, authority over various populations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so thinking about these two cases in comparison, uh, I was wondering whether you saw uh, throughout your ethnographic fieldwork examples of where there was perhaps uh, a dispossession of concern, of responsibility that went hand in hand with the 
possession of authority and control, mm. ways in which populations were being neglected uh, mm -hmm. at the same time as say, uh, surveillance, checkpoints, so on and so forth, were being maintained or extended. Right, um, that's a good question. Um, so it, reconstruction in and of itself after the tsunami, for example, was, uh, was a really interesting process in part because now, the tsunami happened in 2004, and at that time, it was still under the control of the tigers and not the government. And so, um, the East was not seeing a lot of the aid that was being funneled in to the country, and so a lot of reconstruction was happening along the southern coast, which is primarily Sinhalese, actually. Um, and that's where a lot of the tourist uh, beaches and hotels are as well. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not sure if it was necessarily like um, a neglect per se, but um, you know, at least from the Sri Lankan state's perspective, the eastern and the northern coastlines were not necessarily there where they were going to um, help with reconstruction efforts now. And as I mentioned, there was an attempt to uh, create an aid sharing agreement. I mean, there was so much money that was coming in and I can't actually remember the number now, but upwards of a couple hundred million dollars that came in. And um, and that that aid sharing agreement did not happen actually. The the president approved it, but the consti the the parliament uh, deemed it unconstitutional because they said that they were sharing aid with terrorists. Um, and and that's why that flopped. But then of course the government um, that didn't, um, it didn't prevent certain international and foreign aid organizations from getting into the eastern areas. So um, there may have been, I mean, the area has sort of been long neglected by the state because it was um, sort of fought over territory in terms of like sort of like social capital and those kinds of resources. Um, but also um, to the, because the government was not going into that area, actually the, there was a large diasporic Tamil or organization that was actually doing some really quick rebuilding efforts in the eastern and northern parts of the island. An another question for Dr. Chu? I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the um, school system and how the children, are they uh, influenced by the government in some way uh, to have a particular point of view? Um, depends maybe how old the children are. I mean, I think it, it's interesting because, you know, you talk to some uh, kids and also older, young, older kids um, who have only known war for their entire lives. Um, and, and so in a way it's like they kind of don't think about it. I mean, I didn't actually talk to kids. I know that there have been some articles written about the ways in which um, actually the school curriculum and the history books sort of um, uh, contain Sinhalese nationalist propaganda. <laughs> actually, it, it has these sort of old um, historical narratives from say like the Mahavamsa, which is an old text that say that you know the Sinhalese were the original inhabitants of the island. Um, but uh, so, and I'm not, I'm not sure where that, um, if that's been corrected or not in the school curriculum, but um, you know, it kind of, I think it depends a little bit where you are. And in the East, because it's primarily Tamil speaking, um, you know, where they're, in Colombo, where it's a little more mixed in the capital, I can see the, like, schooling being a little more fraught just because the classrooms are mixed. And you can actually, depending on the school that you go to, you can learn in Tamil medium, English medium, or Sinhalese medium. And there is that kind of separation happening. But out east, it's all sort of Tamil speaking. So I don't, I don't really know. Um, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't interviewing a lot of kids necessarily or teachers. But um, so I don't know if that answers your question just a little bit. But I have a comment and a question. Sure. The comment is, I think that it's interesting that in the morning session when we were talking about New Orleans and the destruction that happened there, a lot of the folks 
that lost their homes had been living in, you know, pretty, for lack of a better word, shabby uh, homes and wound up getting homes built that maybe were nicer than what they had. And it sounds like here they had, you know, homes that had concrete slabs and maybe were nicely made and now they're living in tin, tin buildings that they're cooking in, yeah. like literally themselves cooking. But um, so it just, you know, sort of like different governmental uh, reactions or, or ways of dealing with a similar problem. And then the question is, with regard to the parliament, is there any attempt at um, equal representation, even if it's in numbers, even if there is still a dominant, or is it just like? No. <laughs> I mean, it's just who gets elected. Um, and there are, you know, there are different political parties. I mean, there are Tamil political parties. Um, but of course, it, you know, just like most bipartisan politics, and unfortunately, politics has become very polarized in Sri Lanka in the way that, and, and in, through sort of ethnic terms. But you know, there are Muslim political parties, there are Tamil ones, and there are, some are, and there are, you know, mostly, there are mixed ones, and there are um, some that are very, like, pro Sinhalese Buddhism, nationalism. I mean, um, one interesting thing about politics in Sri Lanka is, as I mentioned before, the um, sort of the Sinhalese nationalism is uh, also contains an element of like like hardcore Buddhism, and there are Buddhist monks who are very active in politics. Um, some of whom have been very violent as well. Um, it's it's a really really interesting place and situation. But that and they have and actually you know last year even there were all of these um, marches happening where these Buddhist monks were um, desecrating these um, mosques because they claimed that the mosques were built on um, Buddhist consecrated land. You know, like, you know, it was, it was, it, and, and, and so this sort of, what has ended up happening actually since the end of the war is that it has, um, you know, while the war has over, many say the war is over, but the conflict is still present. And so a lot of the social tensions and issues that have been present for a long time are still happening. And there has been this sort of growing um, Sinhalese Buddhist nationalism that has emerged where they're really trying to, um, it, you know, it's not just the Tamils anymore, but it's like it, they're targeting Muslims now too. Uh, let us thank Dr. Choi.